Hi, this is Gareth L. Powell, and you're listening to the FSF Podcast. The show whose jokes make Vogue and poetry look insanely genius and enjoyable. Our show is brought to you by our charity sponsor, the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund, which supports the Wish Upon a Teen Foundation that helps out sick kids when they need it most. And just imagine the comfort you'll give Red Shirt Crewman number 129. He'll know that when he puts on the red shirt and boards the sentient warship Trouble Dog in helping her to gain atonement, that he didn't leave his family destitute and without hope, because the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund has his back and what's left of his weaponry. All right, so our guest today is an award-winning and widely lauded author at the forefront of speculative fiction. He has won the British Science Fiction Association, also known as the BSFA, award for best novel twice, has been a finalist for The Locust, British Fantasy, and I know I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but the, I'm going to go with uh, Sayin Awards. Uh, now, that's all stolen directly from his website because, let's admit it, I'm lazy and he's an author, so it's he's already written it, so I figured why try to write it better. So I figured you know, let the writer tell us about himself. Anyway, that's all from the fabulous website of our author, our guest today, Gareth L. Powell. Welcome to the FSF Podcast, Gareth. Hi, good to be here. Excellent. I uh, hope you don't mind us plagiarizing your website too too poorly there, but... Uh, <laughs> It was just easier. I'm like, I'm like, how am I going to introduce Gareth? Well, you know, he's got a pretty dandy intro right here. Let's just take that. <laughs> That's what it's for. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so Gareth has has become custom here on our show, uh, especially when we're we're talking to somebody we haven't had a chance to talk to before. Uh, we'd like to know about the backgrounds of our guests because uh, Nick and I, and I, we have a third host. Uh, her name is Kathleen, but she is off uh, on a field trip with her daughter today, so she was unable to make it today. Uh, but uh, we're nerds, and we like to know the origin story of of the people that are sitting across the virtual table from us. And you know, origin stories are always cool to us nerds. So, in the origin story, the beginning of Gareth L. Powell, what was the influence that made you want to be a writer? Was it something just inborn, or was there an outside influence, or was it a combination of both? I think it was a combination of both. Um, I've always loved space, I've always been attracted to sci-fi. I'm, I'm talking here about when I was like three or four years old, and I watched Star Trek on, on an old black and white TV. I think it was probably its first UK run. Um, and then Star Wars came along when I was six, and that was it for me. I was sold. So um, I was very lucky we had a good local library with a huge sci-fi selection, and I went in there, you know, between the ages of, of about eight and 16 and read all the Arthur C. Clarke, all the Heinlein, all the Larry Niven, you know, everything, everything that had a picture of a spaceship or something cool on the cover, I read it. Um, so... And at the same time, there was like the, the Battlestar Galactica, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, E.T., you know, all all the movies. Um, so, yeah, I was pretty much... When I, dis when I decided I was going to write seriously, I didn't really have a choice about genre because you have to write what you're interested in. And, and obviously, I had a lifetime's love of sci-fi to draw on. So it was a foregone conclusion. And then okay. I was bitten by a radioactive SF writer. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I like that. Okay. So is there one particular author whose work stood out to you and, and really drew your attention? You named off a couple there, but was there one of them in particular that, that you found yourself gravitating to more than others? When I, when I was a teenager, I was into the early Larry Niven Nern space stuff. Okay. Like Ringworld and... Uh, his Beowulf Schaefer tales okay. and stuff. But along the way, we kind of diverged and I started getting into different things. I, William Gibson's short story collection, Burning Chrome, I think was one of the major inciting incidents in my decision to start writing seriously because I read that and I thought, okay, you know, while I don't know much about the chain of command or starship captains or emperors, I do know about street level people. He showed you could write about just normal grunts on the ground and that tied up in my head with my love of the films Alien and Aliens, which mm -hmm. are not about the super slick space warships, they're about grunts doing their job. And that kind of that kind of 
that's kind of where my aesthetic came from, I think. The two okay. of those. Definitely. But I also love um, the culture novels by Ian Banks. I read all of those. At a, I read the first four at a very impressionable age, and then I read the rest as they came out. Um, so, yeah, those are the high points, I think. And uh, Samuel Delaney's Nova as well. That's a big influence. Excellent. So I've recently started to make my way through the Embers of War, and I am loving it. And I really like how you, in certain spots, take on the perspective of the ship. And that, I thought, was a really unique way of wor wording things, every pun intended. Uh, but when you're working on being creative, what is it that helps you to be creative and to get that out-of-box thinking? Well, with Embers, it was the first time I'd tried writing a novel in first person instead of third person. Um, and it was a bit of a revelation to me because I found you could just channel the characters' voices and just, poof, it all came out. You could just, like, tap into them and, and you could sort of vomit out a whole chapter from their point of view of them just going, oh, my God. And it was very much, for me, it kind of felt like acting. So hmm. for each chapter, I would kind of put myself into the, you know, the, you know, okay, in this chapter on Trouble Dog, what's she going to say about this? And, you know, usually what she said was full of, you know, cuss words and violence. But, um, you know, for each character, I kind of had a, a little voice in my head and so I would just shift into that voice and you know so I knew which character to go to to get the biggest reaction to each uh, each circumstance so it would just it would really just a case of just channeling their responses yeah it's definitely been a fun read so far and I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to more of it so <laughs> <laughs> and now a word from our show sponsor level up savers their link can be found in the show notes. So, Gareth, so in doing our unprofessional research in order to talk with a professional, uh, we found that, you know, uh, clearly um, he's reading uh, Embers of War. I was looking at the Descendant Machine, uh, which is part of one of your latest offerings, uh, which is part of the Continuance series. And you have a lot of different series, novels, uh, novellas out there. You've been a writer for quite some time. So... I was hoping uh, for those who are not familiar with your work and not familiar with maybe the Descendant Machine, because that is the latest, especially the, that looks like the third part of your, your most recent trilogy, was hoping that you could tell people about the Descendant Machine, why they should be picking up that book and how it fits into that trilogy. First off, it's, it's not part of the trilogy. Um, oh, okay. My apologies. <laughs> the, there are two books. There's uh, Stars and Bones, which came out um, earlier this year. And then there's Descendant Machine, which comes out in April next year. And they are two standalone novels, but they're set in the same universe, if that makes sense. Ah, uh, okay. I think that's maybe where I got confused. Yeah. So we decided, I was talking to my publisher about this idea I had for this scenario, and she said, why don't we try and do two books but so people can pick up the second book without having read the first book and vice versa? So people don't feel they have to collect the series, they can just jump in wherever. Which appealed to me, so I set them, the two books like 50 years apart or something. Um, so there's no real overlap with the characters and they're, you know, self-contained stories. But if you read both of them, you obviously get more because you're more familiar with the, the background and the, the situation, um, which is in, in Stars and Bones, um, it's set 75 years after the human race has been evicted from the planet earth by uh, an alien intelligence who don't think that we're worthy of looking after a planet because we're basically wrecking it um so and when um we accidentally trigger a nuclear war it says okay enough is enough and steps in and uh, whisks us all onto this fleet of giant arcs and sends us off into space 
on the strict instructions we're not allowed to wreck any other planets so basically we as a as a human race we're put on the cosmic naughty step and um uh, sent off and anyway so then 75 years after that a scout ship going ahead of the fleet goes missing and there's the main character uh, who's called uh erin and her sister has gone missing on this scout ship so she sets off um to discover what happened and i don't want to give any spoilers but it's fairly horrific and scary and written during the pandemic and all sorts of stuff happens and then 50 years later we have descendant machine which is uh, again set in this um huge fleet of humanity that's making its way through the stars kind of like battlestar galactica or, or something and once again they run into some trouble um one of their emissaries to a, an alien civilization they've discovered gets fired upon and the main character is trapped in the decaying radioactive remains of her scout ship and she has to escape and find out why she's been attacked so um that's the general setup they're both thrillers they've both got some stars and bones has got a bit more horror element to it uh descendant machine is a bit more mind-blowing space and time stuff so you know take pays your money and you takes your choice hmm. interesting all, right. all sounds fun i do have one question for you though about just and this is just something that honestly just popped in my head so in your introduction and i and i'm listening to a lot of what you're writing you're talking about your writing here and your writing style and all that type of stuff but your your introduction says you're at the forefront of speculative fiction so what does speculative fiction mean i probably should have asked this earlier and i apologize but now with you're talking about you know being evicted and sent off to other planets i'm like okay so is that what that means so that made me yeah. curious um that phrase was written by my one of my publishers um <laughs> <laughs> you're like i take I, that is not mine that is theirs <laughs> That was because um, I had a book about writing um, that came out this year as well from Galantz called About Writing. Yes, saw that. And um, I, I, I lifted that phrase from there. Their, um, they wrote a brief description of who I was for that as well, so I lifted that. Um, but as far I mean, I'm not a fan of speculative fiction as such. I tend to use science fiction because it's a little more clear to the, uh, the the sort of the lay person what it means um but as i understand it speculative fiction is intended to encompass a wide range of like slipstream fiction weird fiction okay. um, fantasy and so on and um i have a sneaking suspicion it's a way of science fiction writers trying to sound more respectable at writer parties saying science mm -hmm. fiction. cool we're going to be speculative podcasters nick <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> I, I got to find a way for us to be <laughs> to sound a little more slick when we get together with other people. Be like, so what do you do? I'm a speculative podcaster. That's right. Yeah, we do podcasting and uh, we speculate about it. That might have to be a thing. <laughs> Surely you're a, clear you're a global internet radio presenter and producer. See, this is why we have really smart people on the show who do the things and write the things to come on and tell us how we need to present ourselves. That's there it is. So we all have a little something that is close to our heart. Which one of your projects was, would you say, is closest to your heart or maybe even a project that's a little less known that you wish to got a little more love? Well, the thing closest to my heart is probably my left lung. Um... <laughs> <laughs> But I'm very fond of all the books that I've written. Uh, uh, if, if there's one that didn't get the the appreciation it deserved, maybe it was uh, a novella I did a couple of years ago from Tor.com, which was called Ragged Alice. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit of a departure for me. It's sort of like a... It's a murder mystery, but there are horror elements and supernatural elements. And it's set in a an out of season seaside resort in Wales, and it's kind of like a Welsh Twin Peaks. Um, and there's the oh, main detective, and she can actually see guilt 
in a person on a person's soul so she kind of sees a glow coming through their skin and if it's mottled and gray she can see there's guilt there um so that helps her kind of in her investigations so it was a very personal book because it put in a lot of feelings i have about whales and a lot of memories i have from childhood visits to wales um my father's family originated in west wales so there was but the the countryside is rugged and very beautiful but at night it can also be incredibly eerie so i, I wanted to get that across as well and i put a, a as you, i put a lot in there it's a very personal um story and it kind of it kind of didn't didn't make much of a splash so yeah if there was one i wish it done better it's probably that one i'll have to check it out and now a word from our sponsor since 1982 vital signs and graphics has been helping professionals with all their image logo and design needs perhaps you're looking for signs and banners truck and trailer lettering business cards, brochures, or other image and marketing aids, Vital Signs and Graphics in-house design studio has you covered. From logos to apparel, start to finish, Vital Signs and Graphics has everything you need to look and feel professional. Call Rick at 231-652-3300. He'll get you noticed. Welcome back to the FSF Popcast. Uh, all right. So, Gareth, you've also, we, as we mentioned in the introduction, you've won several awards, including the British Science Fiction Association Award uh, for novelization twice. You've been nominated for several other awards. We mentioned those in the beginning, and one of which I'm pretty sure I uh, massacred the name and how it's pronounced. But many people, uh, you know, for, for some people, I should say, I shouldn't say many, but for some people, Winning an award, that means absolutely nothing to them. For some people, it means everything. So what does it mean to you personally to be, A, nominated for an award, and then B, to have actually received the award and, and be able to bring it home with you? Does that does it have any personal imprint on you, or is it just nice to know that people like what you do? Um, there, there's definitely a sense of validation when you get nominated. It's like, oh, yeah, somebody... Yeah, people out there like what I'm doing. I'm, you know, there's a feeling of recognition. Of course, there is. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of winning the award, the the re the best thing about winning the award, especially with um, the the novel award, was uh, um, with both the novels. As as soon as I won the award for them, loads of publishers in other countries came forward and said, "We want to print a translated version of this." So oh, cool. I got to sell, you know, I think Embers of War has been published in like about eight different languages or something now because it won that award. And whereas it wouldn't necessarily have got that attention and I wouldn't necessarily have earned that level of income if it hadn't won. So from a business point of view, winning the award is very good and very, very helpful, um, which is one of the reasons I think most people want to win one. Um, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, there probably are some, but I don't know a lot of writers who just want to win one for the kind of the ego kick. We're all wrapped with too much imposter syndrome for that. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, but from, from a business point of view, it really helps be able to put an award-winning sticker on the front of the book or something. Um, and it does attract interest from, from I say, other publishers, which is a, a huge income stream if you're selling the book to eight different countries at roughly the same price to each one it's mm -hmm. you it's basically money for nothing because you've already written the book you're just selling it eight times and also it brought embers to the attention of the studio who are currently adapting it for tv so, i was just wondering if that was a uh, possibility and it, it certainly helped mm. that's fantastic nice congratulations on that that's that's awesome thanks wow I mean, because, you know, I've I've always thought about it. You know, I see the little award, you know, like because my daughter is, um, I mean, she collects books like I collect Funko Pops. And uh, <laughs> so her bedroom walls look like my walls behind me. But, it's, you know, she has almost a complete library in her bedroom. And, you know, we go to Barnes and Nobles and, and uh, you know, Schuler's Books and all these different bookstores all the all the time to take her there and and, uh, and let her do some book shopping. And 
you know, even for myself, as I'm kind of thumbing through, I, you know, I have to admit that little, that little gold circle down on the bottom that says it's, it's won an award somewhere does catch my attention. It makes me look at, a little stronger at the book. Okay, well, if this is an award-winning book, what's so special about it? And then I want to figure out what, you know, about the book and what's going on. So I can see why that would be helpful from the sales standpoint, because as a consumer, I can say that it is very eye-catching. And it makes me makes me wonder. I had not thought about it from this, the aspect of the publisher, though. So that's kind of a nice thought, a new thought for me. I hadn't thought about it from that aspect and how that would also benefit you that, you know, like you said, you have now eight different publishers in all these different countries who want to go now and translate it and sell it. Uh, so that's really cool. And I'm, I'm, that's awesome for you. I'm glad you have that, that level of success. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of people sort of campaign for awards. We're in award season now and a lot of writers will be kind of and i do it myself sometimes but just putting up posts saying what they're eligible for and you know just saying oh by the way this book came out this year if you're voting in the hugos or the nebulas or whatever please remember to you know, nom nominate it if you like it and so on and i think most of them while some of them probably do it for the ego kick as i said most of them are doing it because it will bring their book a little extra sheen of credibility and maybe you know, to a wider audience. It's the same in literary fiction as well. Um, in the UK, a lot of uh, literary novels that come out and are uh, nominated for sort of the Booker Prize, for instance, which is the big UK literary prize. Okay. Um, some of them will have sold three to 500 copies before that. Mm -hmm. But once they get onto that list, they will sell 40,000 copies, maybe. I don't know exact figures but they will see a massive spike in sales that they just would not have got otherwise because a lot of literary fiction unless you have a big blockbuster doesn't seem to sell a great deal so um yeah there's a definite economic benefit to uh, to winning prizes and i think that's why some publishers really push to get their their authors onto shortlists as well. yeah i can see why they would do that absolutely i mean the publisher's there to make money that's their job you know they want to the more they can promote your book and get it out there in, in front of people and, and all these different things, the better chance they have of, of it getting sold and, you know, then they make money and you're making, yeah. So from an economic standpoint, I understand why they would push for that. That makes sense. I really hadn't considered it that, that it was given an opportunity to go to other countries though. That's just kind of new thought. So, you know, I learned something today. There it is. That's what I learned. So my dad has also written several stories from beer fiction to some sci-fi parodies. And usually, no matter what the topic is, he's always done some sort of research. So what kind of research do you do in preparation of writing one of your stories? It depends on the particular story. Um, usually I write space opera, so mm -hmm. I've got a... a a fairly good, um, you know, grasp of, of how space works and how space right. travels. Uh -huh. Basic Newtonian physics. I'm not an expert in any shape or form, um, but you know, mm -hmm. I, I've read a lot of sci-fi. I've read some science. I've seen shows like The Expanse where they get it a lot more, mm -hmm. um, a lot more correct than sort of Star Wars or so. So there's not a lot of swooping about and air Second World War plane noises in my novels, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so i try and keep it as plausible as possible and the rest of it i frankly make up because you know nobody knows how to build a hyperdrive so i can just make make up how it works and put my own rules around it and so on with something like ragged alice which is set in the present day and the main character being a police officer i had to do some research into the way um sort of the British police would organize a murder investigation, how it would be structured, who would be in charge, who would report to who, blah, 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 blah. So for that one, I actually had to do, I brought a book written by an ex-policeman on how it works and everything. And um, so I hopefully got that as correct as I could. But with 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 the sci-fi, you know, I make a lot of it up. As long as it sounds plausible and it serves the story, then, then I'm happy. Um, I'm not one of these people who computes in great detail the orbit of every planet in their book so they can tell what season it is and who cares so life's too short i've got fish to cap right so what is your process of i 
going from blank page to getting a well-rounded story? I know that's a, a very large question in general, but like, do you like just sit at a coffee shop, have a notebook, start writing things down? Um, or do you just sit at a computer and start plucking away? Like, um, I'll, I'll sit, I usually sit at the computer with, um, a word document and start kind of typing, um, ideas into it mm -hmm. and trying to write an outline. So I'll be basically okay. telling a story and the outline will probably be no more than a page, but it'll be kind of, uh, there's this person and they need to find this thing and the, this will get in the way and then they'll need to do this. And then I'll go back and I'll revisit that outline over and over and over again, rewrite it maybe a dozen times, throw in other things, take out other things and just keep going until suddenly I feel, okay, I think we've kind of got something here and then I can start writing. And it's usually when I found out who the main character is and roughly what they want, then I can, start to put things in motion and writing that first few chapters is how I feel my way into the story and work out who the narrator is and that all kind of that's the creative part where it all kind of arises off the page as I'm writing it um, I'm not somebody who plans in great detail beforehand I like to actually roll up my sleeves and sort of plunge my hand into the clay and make it on the wheel as it's going mm -hmm. around okay so your story evolves as you're writing it then yeah Perfect. Uh, Gareth, with all that you've written, the, the series, the standalone sci-fi works, the novellas as well, uh, people may be confused as to where they should or could jump in to your works. Now, I'm sure you've had people ask you before, where's a good place to start with your work? So here we are asking that question again. Do you have a recommendation for people who are interested in getting to know your work? But here's, you know, this is the place for them to start. I usually recommend Embers of War. It's the first one of a trilogy. And it's also the most popular book I've written. It, it's outsold all my other books put together. So I think it's probably a great place to start because there seem to be so many people who've read it and loved it and fed back to me how, you know, how they love all the characters. So um, I cannot ignore that. So I would say start with Embers of War. For whatever reason, my, I keep looking at, and I'm going to probably mispronounce this too, so please feel free to correct me, but I keep looking at because the illustrations on the cover uh, honestly amuse me uh, for Ak Ak Macaque, and uh, <laughs> I, I haven't had a chance to read them yet, but that is on my short list of, of things to, to read, um, just because, uh, as the description here, a cigar-chomping monkey with nuclear-powered zeppelins electronic <laughs> souls i'm like yeah okay this to me i'm like <laughs> it just looks like a lot of fun and so i'm i'm hoping that uh i'm hoping to to get to those very shortly but yeah the cigar chomping monkey holding a massive revolver in his hand um kind of sold me so they're, they're basically um near future thrillers in a in a sort of philip k dick william gibson black mirror kind of mold um okay. except one of the characters is a an uplifted monkey who has been artificially granted a, a human level awareness um and is pretty pissed off about it mm. so um and it's there's a lot of kind of twists and turns and action um, so yeah, but if you, if you like kind of kinetic thrillers, um, uh, and vast amounts of swearing, then, then you'll probably enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Good, good notice. But yeah, uh, honestly, if you guys go to his website and we'll have a, a link for this down in the show notes below for me, that's, that's where I'm going to go. That's where probably where I'll, I'll be starting just because again, the cigar chomping monkey with the massive revolver, it just, yeah, it just looks really cool to me. So. So Gareth, we have a Facebook group with about 208,000 plus members, and it is just filled with memes. We got this universe mixed with that universe. So if your ship, the troubled dog, got sucked into another universe, which universe would you like to see the troubled dog in? Well, if I'm being kind to her, I think... Um... <laughs> If she got sucked into Ian Banks's culture universe, she would find a lot of other sentient starships who, mm -hmm. who she could hang out with and, and have a great time. And, and if I was feeling devilish, I would 
um, drop her into the middle of the, uh, the Star Trek universe because um, I, I think she would she would go toe to toe with a few uh, Federation ships easily enough, mm. um, and the Klingons wouldn't stand a chance. So, uh, so one thing, in, um, obviously, because she's got a, a huge advantage over Star Trek starships in that her bridge is located in the center of the vessel inside another ball of hull plating so it's like double armored and buried so it's like a bunker because it's the most important room on the ship whereas the federation like to stick theirs on the top like a hood ornament um <laughs> and very it's, it's, so you can just shoot it off at any point um so yeah i think she could she could probably i mean she uh, it's in the book. She's a very sharp aim. She's able to, um, you know, with a, a torpedo defense cannons, is it, she's able just to to blow somebody's kneecap off about a mile away or something. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think she would have absolutely no trouble at all in, in in taking out most of the Federation fleet by just shooting their bridges off the top of their saucer sections, you know. And she operates on nanosecond um, sort of time scales, whereas by the time it takes Captain Kirk to scratch himself and tell Scott <laughs> us Scott what to do then, you know she would have been and gone so yeah uh, uh, that's right. a interesting point though you know having the most important part of the ship you know like a bunker instead of a hood hood ornament that's yeah. fascinating and haven't thought of it that way and Star Wars is always the hood ornament yeah so <laughs> something that can be easily exploded or destroyed and gotten into yeah but somehow they never do okay uh (laughs) all right so gareth uh we always end our show in one of two ways we either go into a quiz where we ask our guests a random number of things about sci-fi whatever else uh it may be that's something relevant to the per why the person's here or we ask them a silly question and today we're going to ask you a silly question all right so Apart from sci-fi, which we have a deep appreciation for, we also have a deep appreciation for all things pop culture, and that, of course, includes music. So we'd love for you to tell us what song you feel best describes you and why. Good Lord. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I have a very wide-ranging musical taste. Um, That's awesome. That's even better. Everything from sort of house music to heavy metal to jazz to... You know, perfect I'm classical opera. Um, so I'm intensely spoiled for choice. Um, what song describes me? Uh, Bad to the Bone. Um, <laughs> there's a uh, Sam and Dave's Soul Man. Uh, nice, good choice. Yeah, um, I don't think I'm quite that cool though. So, um, <laughs> probably no idea. Lawyers, Guns, and Money. Okay. Excellent. That's All good cool. choices. Yeah, I, I like those. <laughs> I think if I was to pick one for myself, um, there's the band Three Doors Down. They've got a song called Running Out of Days, and it's all about how he's always busy. He's never never has enough time to get anything done, and it's just the whole song is talking about that, and I'm like, you know, this, this is way too close to home. I could have written this song. <laughs> so, yeah, I think if, it was, if for me, that would probably be it, my choice. I used to think it was paperback writer till um, an editor online pointed out all the mistakes in the song. Like, don't do this. No, you don't do that. That's <laughs> nice. Well, Gareth, thank you so much for being on our show today. Where can our listeners go to find out more about you and your works? Well, they can go to my website, which is garethlpowell.com. Or they can find me um, on Twitter and Instagram and Mastodon and Hive and probably several other places I can't think of right now because there are so many of them as Gareth L. Powell. Um, You know, I don't hide behind any uh, pseudonyms or anything. So basically go onto your favorite social media platform and type in Gareth L. Powell and you've got a pretty good chance of finding them. We will make sure that we get those put into our show description so that our listeners can check them out. Thank you. Excellent. And so we want to remind everybody that subscribing is the single most important thing that you can do to help us get 
more amazing guests like Gareth L. Powell here today to have these discussions and have funny moments for you guys to be able to laugh and enjoy listening to. So please subscribe. It helps us far more than we can ever really describe. And be sure to go to GarethLPowell.com. Check out Gareth's works. He's got some new stuff coming up soon. And uh, you guys are going to want to be able to buy that and check that out as well. However, if for whatever reason you are not happy with the content of our show today, please feel free to lodge a complaint with the head of our complaint department. That, of course, is Gareth's editor. Look, no one is as ruthless or as brutal as a highly trained editor. They are skilled in finding errors and mistakes and removing them which is, of course, the part that worries us. And if we're being honest, that's the part that should worry you, too. If your two copies of your complaint aren't filled out right, look, I'm just saying, they make mistakes disappear. So maybe just keep that in mind before you get all reporty on us for being the bad hosts that we are. <laughs> Thanks again, Gareth. Thank you, Gareth. It's a lot of fun. All right, guys, that's going to conclude us for the FSF podcast. Goodbye. Ciao. On behalf of the rest of the hosts of the FSF Popcast, we want to thank you for listening to this episode. If you'd like to be a guest on a future episode, please contact us by means of Twitter or Instagram using the handle at FSF Popcast or go to www.fsfpopcast.com and click on the contact me link. Thanks again and hope you enjoyed the episode. <laughs>